What's up, guys? This is Ryan from Bible Dingers, and I am here with another very exciting video in our God and Science series. And in this video, we have a special guest, Dr. Andrew Snelling, to talk about the flood. Dr. Snelling, thank you so much for being on the show. First, for anybody who hasn't heard of you before, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and your background? Yes, I can, Ryan. I'm, as you can tell from the way I speak, I'm actually a native Australian, and uh, I'm living here in northern Kentucky. I work for Answers in Genesis. Uh, I got here uh, over the, by born and raised in Australia, trained in Australia, did a, a geology degree, a PhD in geology, worked in Australia in geology before I ventured into full-time uh, creation ministry, research, writing, initially in Australia. Um, for, for a few years, I worked for the Institute for Creation Research, still based in Australia. But for the last 10 years, I've been here working for Answers in Genesis, close to the Creation Museum that uh, Answers in Genesis built and opened in 2007. And in two, 2016, they opened the Ark Encounter, which isn't too far from me. So I'm a research scientist, a geologist, uh, I uh, do research, speaking, writing, publishing, uh, all on this issue of, of the Bible and science, particularly dealing with the early chapters of Genesis. Excellent. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, we have you on to talk about Noah's flood specifically. And so before we get into it, can you just sort of explain what you would say the flood is? is just give us a general overview of Noah's flood. Well, we start with a biblical description because uh, now God's word is our authority. And basically we read that in Genesis one, God created, and then there was the pre-flood civilization uh, for 1650 odd years, uh, the population grew, but wickedness spread and uh, God uh, found Noah and warned him that there was going to be a, an event called the flood. And he was instructed to build an ark and God was going to send animals to him to take on the ark because it was going to be a global event. I mean, God even instructed Noah that he was going to take birds on board the ark. If the, if the flood was only local, then, um, then birds could fly away to non-flooded areas to survive. Uh, but the birds are mentioned uh, the most of any creature uh, in Genesis uh, 6, 7, 8, 9. And so uh, that gives us a clue, plus the description that God gives uh, of the fountains of the great deep breaking open, water coming in fr from inside the earth, and that the, the torrential rainfall for 40 days and 40 nights, so the waters rose until all the high hills and the mountains under the whole heaven were covered. And the description is in global terms. So, yeah, there was Noah with his animal cargo that God had sent to him, put him on board this ark, and he, they were floating on the waters, and the waters rose and covered all the mountains and of the pre-flood earth, eroded everything away. And then when he stepped out of the ark after just over a year, you know, local floods don't last for a year, uh, over a year, he stepped out into a whole different new world because God had said he was going to destroy the earth with man. And the global flood is a way to do that because moving water erodes, it, it uh, carries sand and mud, and it's going to uh, pick up animals and plants and it's going to bury them in that, in that sand and mud. And so it was a, a global catastrophic event. And the Bible makes it clear that after Noah and his family came off the ark, then people began to multiply again on the earth. And uh, you and I, Ryan, uh, are, are, are brothers going back in the big family picture, going back to Noah prior to that, back to, to Adam. We're all in a, and, and, you know, I know, I know it's a side issue, but it means that all the people on the earth today are descended from Noah. So there's no, no excuse for not regarding other people in other parts of the world as being our brothers and sisters, common humanity. Gotcha. So 
I appreciate that uh, general overview. I wanted to ask around what year would you say this global flood occurred? Well, it really depends. That, you know, there's a bit of debate. We're only talking of thousands of years ago. There's, there's, there's a couple of chronologies, biblical chronologies that people are still sorting through. There's the, the chronology that's based on what is called the Masoretic text of the scripture. And then there's the, 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 there's the, the text that comes from the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. And there's a slight disparity of about a thousand years between those two. But you know, you're either talking about four and a half thousand years ago on the Masoretic or five and a half thousand years ago on the Septuagint. So you're only talking very recent compared to the time scale that the, the general scientific community uses. Gotcha. So I'm interested about sort of specifics on the animals that were on the ark, specifically things like dinosaurs, fish, bugs, like things that seem counterintuitive almost to bring on an ark. Was that was every species or kind represented on the ark? Yeah, well, no, because the Bible says it was only the land-dwelling, air-breathing creatures that were taken on the ark. The fish didn't have to go on the ark because it was a watery catastrophe. They could survive in the ocean. So there's no mention of those. It's all the air-breathing, land-dwelling creatures. And it's two, two of every kind and seven of some, the clean animals. Um, and so it, we're talking about mammals. We're talking about uh, reptiles, uh, not so many amphibians, we're talking about birds. And so we're not talking about a huge number. Um, when, you, when you realize that um, uh, dogs are related to wolves and foxes, in fact, you know, I just even read today, they're trying to figure out which wolf is the closest ancestor of all the domestic dogs that we have today. And I think there's some, some wolf in Japan they were talking about recently and were looking at the genetic studies. So it's well known in the scientific community. And it's not, we're not talking about the species level. That's a human classification system. If you go back up through the you know, canines or dogs, you're going up higher in the classification system, even above a genus, probably to a family. Same with the cats. Um, you know, lions can breed with tigers. You get ligers and, and tions and, and panthers and pumas and uh, bobcats, they're all, all part of the cat family. And so the Bible uses the term kinds in Genesis 1, and it also uses it in Genesis 6 and 7 in relation to the animals that are going on the flood, uh, going on the ark. And so we're only looking at when you start, we did a study, we had some scientists come together to do a study on this. We're only talking about something like 14 to 16,000 kinds that would have been represented on the ark. In fact, it's amazing. The birds, the ducks are all, all related. They can all interbreed um, swans. And so it whittles down the numbers. And so 14 to 16,000, you know, pairs, pairs of animals and seven of some, the clean ones. You know, you, know, you could be only talking about 40, 40 to 50,000 animals per se. And, and many of them are only small and they were small ones. And uh, they had to be young ones because what was the purpose of them going on the ark? They were to get off the ark afterwards, get married and have kids to repopulate the world. So you didn't take big, big old dinosaurs that were large. Yes, dinosaurs would have been represented on the ark because they're land dwelling, air breathing animals. And uh, we know they existed prior to the flood because we had their bones in the fossils. And so small ones, I mean, they hatched out of an egg the size of a football. So small young ones were still only quite, quite small. Most dinosaurs were actually small. A lot of the hype is about the huge dinosaurs, but they're the big old dinosaurs. And so, uh, you know, you read about the dimensions of the ark in the scriptures. Um, it's, it's longer than a football field and uh, three decks. Um, and so it, it was a huge vessel. Uh, it, it, the space is equivalent to over 500 standard railway stock cars. So, you know, that's a, that's a lot of space. 
for knowing his family, for the food, and for you know, 40 to 50,000 animals at most, including a lot that was small. And so, um, yeah, room on the ark wasn't a problem. And some animals, of course, hibernate when there's danger. And so, you know, the whole account of the flood is plausible. It's one of the things that I'm involved in with others uh, of, of explaining to people that the details are believable. What the Bible tells us stacked up against the science of, of all the animals, etc., and the building of the ark, etc., it is totally believable. And that's what we demonstrate at our uh, rep ark replica that we built here in northern Kentucky and also in our creation museum. I definitely want to get into the scientific plausibility, but I wanted to make sure we tackled some of the biblical questions before we get into that um my first one is what do you think about uh a less i suppose plain reading of the flood account and people who say that it was a local flood well i go to what jesus told us in in matthew 24 he the, the disciples were asking him about the signs of his coming again. And uh, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming day of the Son of Man. The flood came and took them all away. And so he was comparing the flood with his second coming. And the question is, is his second coming going to be local? No, it's going to be global. And one of Jesus' listeners was the Apostle Peter, and in 2 Peter chapter 3, he specifically warned that in the last days there will come scoffers who will be willingly ignorant of the evidence and instead say there never was a global flood. They doubt the evidence for creation, the world that, uh, you know, that in the beginning the, 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 water, the earth was formed out of the water and from water and... Uh, and made it stand up above the water, and that the world that then ex existed was overflowed or deluged with water, and the heavens and the earth, which are now reserved under fire for judgment at the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And so he, Peter is comparing the creation with the flood and the second coming. And uh, it's because these scoffers say there never was a global flood that they say, well, why are you Christians talking about Jesus coming again? There can't be a a global second coming. And so I don't have to just go to Genesis. I have to go also to what Jesus said and what Peter understood. Second Peter chapter three is a commentary on what Jesus was saying there uh, in Matthew 24. And so from a plausibility aspect, if it was a local flood, as some say in the Mesopotamian basin, where do the waters of the Mesopotamian basin drain into? the Persian Gulf. So how come the ark didn't get washed down into the Persian Gulf? It actually landed on a mountain in the opposite direction. I mean, that it doesn't stack up with a local flood. All the high mountains under the whole, if you think about it, Ryan, if you get the mountains covered in one area, then water's going to keep flowing. You've got to keep adding it to keep those mountains covered. And so it's going to spill over into the next area to cover the mountains in that area to keep rising to cover the mountains in the initial area. I mean, you, all the high hills under the, and the mountains under the whole heaven, the description, remember, it's from God's perspective because Noah was inside the ark. He couldn't see what was going on out because God shut him in. The account in Genesis is God's description, not Noah's. And so God, when God says all our hills under the whole heaven and the mountains were covered, it's, it's definitely a description of, the, of a global event. And Jesus echoes that when he compares it with his second coming. Hmm. I, haven't heard, um, I haven't heard that scripture in Matthew 24 used to defend a global flood about his second coming. That is interesting. I have heard the um, the scripture in Second Peter, though, and the rebuttal that I've heard to that is that when the flood is brought up, there's a qualifier when it's talking about the world 
and it says in the ESV, for instance, it says the ancient world. And so I've heard um, supporters of a local flood say that if it was a global flood, there would be no need for that qualifier in Second Peter to say the ancient world. No, pre-flood world. The pre-flood world, you can call it ancient. They're all, they're all synonymous. It's not ancient is not necessarily a localized term. And why, why would Peter be talking about a global flood when he's comparing it with uh, the scoffers doubting the evidence for creation and using uh, the doubting of the flood to, to uh, repudiate the idea or, or lampoon Christians for talking about a global second coming? You know, it, it just doesn't stack up when you do that, that kind of comparison. The mm. qualifier is 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 not necessarily a localized term gotcha gotcha so next i want to you are a doctored geologist so i'm sure you have plenty to say about the scientific evidence of a global flood so is there something that we can look at in nature that points to a global flood well absolutely because you know I often do with people what Jesus did with people. He often asked them a question for them to answer when they asked him a difficult question. That's how he got around their difficult question. You know, they said, should we pay our taxes to Caesar? He said, well, show me a penny whose inscription on it. Well, people say, oh, there's no evidence for a global flood. Well, wait a minute. If the flood really occurred as described in Genesis with all the hails under the whole of heaven being covered with water, and all flesh died, all flesh died, it says, then what evidence we'd look for? Wouldn't we expect to find billions of dead things, plants and animals, buried in rock layers of sand and mud that was laid down by water all over the earth? And that's exactly what we find. Billions of dead things uh, called fossils buried in rock layers called sedimentary rock layers that were deposited by water all over the earth. Furthermore, 95% of the fossils are shallow water marine fossils, clams, corals, those sorts of creatures. And where do we find them buried? They lived in the ocean. Today, they live on the shallow ocean floor. We don't find them buried and fossilised there. We find them buried and fossilised on the continents. And that's, that's a significant point. How did they get there? Even the secularists say the fossils, the marine fossils we find on the continents had to be, the ocean waters had to rise up and cover the continents to, to bury those fossils. And then we ask the question, well, how do, what sort of conditions do you need to form a fossil? Because the secular view is that it, it happened very slowly. Over millions of years, the oceans came in and then it went out again. But... Where are all the dead, you know, you often get told, you know, fish dies, it sinks to the bottom where it's slowly covered up by sand and mud and fossilised. But where are all the dead fish on the bottom of the ocean waiting to be fossilised? When a creature dies, it either rots or gets eaten by scavengers. I mean, we know that today. Leave a, a, a dead cow out in the paddock and uh, there's not much of it left within a few days. So... When you look at the fossil record and you find fish fossilised eating another fish, you find a fish, fish with undigested fish in their stomachs. You find marine reptiles fossilised in the process of giving birth to a baby. Um, you find dinosaur soft tissue complete with blood cells. You find uh, squid with the ink sacs still with, with ink in them. Still, you find skin, um, you know, you find wasps with their, their wing venation preserved. You find flowers. I mean, how are any of these fossils jellyfish fossils? We know they melt in the, on a beach, washed up on a beach within a day. How do you find hundreds and hundreds of these jellyfish fossils beautifully preserved in outback South Australia? So fossilization is a rapid process. And when you see fossil after fossil multiplied, and in fact, we don't find the fossils in their ones and twos, 
we find them in what we call fossil graveyards on mass. There was mass destruction. I'm here in the Cincinnati area and I'm sitting on a massive fossil graveyard of trillions of, of shellfish, uh, corals, clams, those sorts of sorts of creatures. And they're not the buried the way they lived because they're all haphazard and jumbled up together. Were, and, and this is not where they live. This is where they're buried. They're buried. I mean, the ocean is a thousand miles away and I'm uh, 500 miles away. I'm nearly a thousand feet above sea level today. And, you know, we've got We've got marine fossils in layers as high as the Himalayas. The Himalayas weren't there before the flood because they're made up of fossil bearing layers that were produced by the flood. And so we find this on every continent and these layers that contain these fossils are often found right across the continents. We can, we can trace, for example, um, a sandstone at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with the first fossils in it. You can, you can trace that up to Colorado Springs, right up there to, to um, into Wyoming. You can follow it across um, Missouri. It's under here in Ohio. You can see it outcropping in, um, in Wisconsin. And in fact, the same sandstone you can find in, on uh, Greenland. You can find the same sandstone across North Africa. You can find it in Southern Israel. And, and, and beyond there. So these are layers that are very extensive. Uh, one I like to point out particularly um, because it's spread right across the Midwest of the United States. We see it again right across Europe, right across the Middle East, ac across England. It's the famous chalk beds. It's a type of limestone. Everyone knows about the white cliffs of Dover, thousand feet thick. And uh, those chalk beds can be traced from England and Northern Ireland right across Europe, down, down through the Middle East to Kazakhstan, Egypt, etc. Same chalk beds through the mid, right across the Midwest United States. Uh, the same chalk beds are found in Southern Western Australia. And these chalk beds are made up of microscopic shellfish, but they've also contained very large fossils. And uh, for example, in the Sternberg Museum at Fort Hayes in Kansas, where the chalk outcrops, there's a 12 foot long fish with an undigested fish in its stomach. Um, there's dinosaurs and there's bird fossils buried with that large fish fossil. So you've got land, sea, and air dwelling creatures all buried together with marine, in a marine, uh, marine layer deposited by ocean waters rising over the continents. And here's another issue, Ryan. Um, the geologists today look at present day processes as the explanation for how things formed in the past. They call it the present is the key to the past. And so where do we find lime accumulating today on the ocean floor? Well, yeah, out in the ocean floor. And it, it accumulates in a fraction of an inch every thousand years. It's called calcareous ooze. And that's, that's the analog that they use, the, the idea that they use, the comparison that they use for formation of limestones like chalk. But at a fraction of an inch every thousand years, how are you going to bury a 12 foot long fish with an undigested fish in its stomach? How are you going to bury 10 foot high dinosaur and uh, birds that are six to eight, eight feet tall, all in the same layer. It had to be catastrophic to get them all buried together and so well preserved. And yet the scale is ginormous. We're talking about right across the North American continent. We're talking about right across Europe at the same time and, and down in Australia. I mean, we're talking about global layers with global fossils and marine fossils buried up on the continents mixed in with land fossils. I mean, that's exactly the sort of evidence I'd expect to find based on the description there in the book of Genesis for the global catastrophic flood in the days of Noah. After all, why did Noah have to build an ark? If it was a local flood, God could have said, Noah, pack up, I'll give you 50 years 
to move out of that region to higher ground because I'm going to destroy that area. It doesn't make any sense unless it was a global flood. And the geological evidence speaks to that very, very powerfully. The problem is that most people are thinking about the layers at the very top of the, of the, of the Earth's surface as being the record of the flood. No, it's all those layers going down. In the walls of the Grand Canyon, we're talking about all the horizontal layers that are over a mile thick they're in the Grand Canyon area. That area, they're all part of, of this flood deposition. And those are the layers that can be traced right across the North American continent and beyond. And it's not just me saying that. It's been in the secular literature now for six decades that the layers that are found across the North American continent and can be traced to other continents form uh, uh, the, the layers can be traced. I mean, the, the oil companies figure this out and, this, and the academic geologists figure this out by talking to one another, they realise that many of these layers are connected right across, the, right across the continent and indeed around the globe. And that's exactly what we'd expect to find from a global catastrophic flood. I mean, that's a lot to digest in one, one mouthful and we can break that down if you want to and I can say other things, but I'll leave it there for a moment to give you a chance. Yeah, so we can start with the layers um, because you were speaking about that quite a bit, geologist. That's what your specialty is. So I'm thinking, and I, I don't know geology. I'm, I'm not a geologist. Um, this is just me and, and my brain kind of working here. So I'm thinking that if the flood was global, wouldn't we see in the layers, and, and I'd, I'd like for you to tell me if this is the case or not, would, is there sort of a mixing of dinosaurs with modern, what we see in the modern day uh, animals, as well as fish and things like that? Is there sort of a mixing in the layers? And also, is it sort of spread out? Like, do we see, I don't know, would we see an animal that's not from the North American continent, would we see it floating on over to the European continent and ending up in their layers over there or something like that? Is there sort of this interplay of animals in the geologic layers? Well, for starters, the North American and Europe continents, European continents didn't exist as such prior to the flood. I mean, the, the world was totally reshaped. We're living on top of the graveyard produced by the flood. That's the first point. The second point is, that um, let's go to the Grand Canyon. At the top of the Grand Canyon, if you go to the South Rim, you get deer and you get Ponderoso pine. You go down the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you don't get deer, you get cacti and bighorn sheep. In other words, you get climatic and elevation differences produce biological communities. And so when you read, or when you think about the flood, where did the flood begin? The Bible specifically says the fountains of the great deep. Okay. The deep in Hebrew is the ocean basins. And so the, the flood began with rifts in the ocean basins and water coming out. And so what is going to happen first is the first part of the earth's surface to be disturbed is going to be the ocean floor. And so therefore we would predict that the first creatures to be buried in the fossil record as a result of the flood would be marine creatures. And in fact, when we go to the fossil record, the bottom part of the fossil record is exclusively marine creatures. And then as the waters rose, because they would rise, they're progressively going to inundate, inundate biological communities on the land at different elevations. And they're going to wipe them out and bury them before they, the right water rises. And so the order in the fossil record is actually a, an order of different biological communities at different, different elevations. And so we don't, you know, a lot of people think you're going to get all mixed up. No, because the flood is going to progressively destroy and bury as it rises. And so you're going to get creatures that live together, basically buried together. You will get some exceptions, and we certainly do that. You see, um, for example, um, dinosaur fossils 
you can find marine fossils buried with dinosaur fossils. They don't live together, but they're buried together because the ocean waters brought up the marine creatures at when, when they came up and, and, and carried the dinosaurs away and buried the marine creatures with those dinosaurs. So we do see some mixtures, but we also see a general order, which is a, an order of progression as the flood waters rose higher and higher to get different biological communities. So for example, in the Grand Canyon, if you'd have flood that area progressively, cacti would get buried before you get Ponderoso pine buried because the waters would reach the cacti at the bottom of the Grand Canyon before they rose higher to bury the Ponderoso pines. So if I was to play devil's advocate and say I was coming from the worldview that evolution has caused us to be through random mutation, isn't there historical view, I suppose, on how we came about? Doesn't it start with marine life and then move on to different classes? And uh, would they, wouldn't they say that the reason marine life is on the bottom layer is because they're the oldest life forms and then the next layer is the next oldest and so on and so forth and that the layers are sort of different ages of animals is what i was taught in you know yeah, but it's an school. interpretation you don't find labels on the la on the rock layers saying i'm 100 million years old or i'm 400 million years old um that is merely a man-imposed interpretation on the layers. And yes, it is true that you find the marine, marine creatures at the bottom, but here's the important thing. You go at the beginning of the, the fossil record, you go in the deeper layers, there's hardly any fossils, of mainly microscopic uh, fossil material. Suddenly, you get to an erosion surface, which is an erosion surface that can be traced all around the globe. And the secularists accept that as well. And then suddenly you get the so-called Cambrian explosion. You go from, you go from uh, um, uh, just single cells and a few cell multicellular creatures. Suddenly you get all these body plans of all the different phyla all of a sudden. Even St Stephen Jay Gould, the renowned paleontologists of the 20th century, late 20th century, had no answer for the Cambrian explosion. He couldn't explain how you went from no, no multicellular um, uh, macroscopic life with all the different body plans uh, to suddenly all these body plans appear. For, for example, the trilobite is one of the earliest of these creatures, and it's very complex. It's got a it's got a complex lens system in its eye, multi multi lens system in each eye, and it's highly co and and in the layers below, there's no ancestors. I mean, we don't find the transis transitional fossils. We find the fossils appear suddenly in the fossil record, fully formed, without any hint of an ancestor. And once they appear in the fossil record, Stephen J. Gould said, and Niles Elridge from the American Museum of Natural History. They either stay the same or they go extinct. They get destroyed. And that's exactly what we'd expect. Some creatures in the flood, particularly marine creatures, would survive through the flood. Others would, would be destroyed uh, because they became extinct. They couldn't survive in the flood waters or they, they, weren't, they weren't on the ark and were wiped out. Only the animals on the ark would have lived on into the post-flood world, but even then, some of those would have had difficulty surviving because of the change ecological conditions in the post-flood world. So um, the, the, the evolutionary idea is a, an interpretation of the evidence. And you might say, yes, well, aren't you interpreting the evidence too? So, so but my basis is taking the God's word. God was there and he has given us a record of what he, he did through history, and uh, it's very important because why is that history important? Is because it's Jesus's family tree. How is Jesus the, the last Adam if he isn't connected biologically to the first Adam, uh, uh, first Adam, the real Adam in the Garden of Eden? 
how can he be our kinsman redeemer if he wasn't related to the first Adam who, who disobeyed and rebelled? How could he be the promised redeemer that even Adam and Eve knew, knew about? And so that history does matter because it's Jesus's history. And uh, it traces the ancestry of Jesus back through Noah, back to, back to Adam. And uh, the, flood, the flood is part of that history. Hmm. So we're, we're running a little tight on time here. So I wanted to, to just give you uh, three quick rebuttals that I've heard to your position. Um, a couple of them being from the famous Bill Nye Ken Ham debate that mm -hmm. I I just looked before this. It looks like almost nine million people have watched at this point, which is incredible. Um, the first one that bothered me for a long time after watching it was, do you remember the illustration he used with the kangaroo getting over to Australia, and how there's no sort of fossil record from, um the Arabian Peninsula over to Australia. What would you say about that? Well, I would say that, um, you know, there were, there were thousands of bison on the Western plains of North America and they almost became extinct and there's no fossil evidence of them living there in recent history. Um, you've got to have specialised conditions for fossilization. The kangaroo fossils that we find are primarily in Australia and they are there in, in sinkholes and in small pockets where localised events occurred post-flood. In other words, the fossils themselves are post-flood. The animals, the, the fossils in Australia of kangaroos weren't there uh, a record of animals that lived there prior to the flood. No, that the, the fossil, the uh, kangaroos got to Australia and we'll get to that point in a moment. And then the fossils are found where the animals lived. They're only in little surficial pockets that I would maintain a post-flood fossil, a post-flood fossil record. As for how they get got there, well, after the flood, first of all, uh, first of all, after the flood, there was um, water levels were a, a different around the globe. Sea level varied. Uh, as there was still land was still adjusting. There was vegetation still being ripped off in some parts where animals, as happens in the uh, Amazon basin today, vegetation gets ripped up and the animals end up out in the Atlantic Ocean. Animals would get there by, by rafting. Even the secularists say that Madagascar was populated by animals that got rafted across from, from South Africa. Also, when, uh, when there was an ice age after the flood, because we've got the polar ice caps as the remnant of that ice age, sea level was lower, and there was a land bridge not only across Asia to North America, but there was actually a land bridge from Asia down into Australia. And so uh, uh, the, the, um, the kangaroos and people could easily migrate down into Australia until the ice age was over and the waters would rise again. There's many ways to explain how uh, the, the, the issue of the kangaroos. And by the way, if there was a pair of kangaroos on the ark, they had to go in the same direction from the ark. And then, then when they got children, they'd all stay together as the same mob and, and keep moving in the same direction away from their predators. As, as the, and so you wouldn't have them necessarily scattering in all different directions. They tend to move just in the, in the one direction. And that gotcha. was the direction they ended up. They got to Australia and then they got isolated in Australia because that land bridge got, got uh, inundated. I see. I see. So one, I'm going to mix the last two into one because they're both sort of similar. Um, I wanted to ask about the sort of implications of the water covering the entirety of the earth. The first one I've heard that the salt water and fresh water mixing would cause all of the marine life to die and and no marine life would survive the flood because of the mixing of the salt water and the fresh water and then the second question i wanted to ask about the the global inundation is i've also heard that just the 
sort of weight of the waters would cause the crust of the earth to implode on itself because it wouldn't be able to handle the weight of all that water covering the earth. So what, what would you say to those two things? Well, first of all, how much water are they talking about? I'm not talking about water covering Mount Everest. The people who use that argument are saying Mount Everest had to be covered by water. No, it says the highest mountains were only covered by 15 cubits. Okay, that's about 25 feet. Um, and remember that the mountains today, like the Himalayas, the Appalachians, the Rockies, all, all contain... Uh, fossil bearing layers that were produced by the flood. The mountains were pushed up late. The present mountains were pushed up late in the flood. Um, some of that earth movements are still occurring today as a consequence of the flood. So there wasn't a huge weight of water to begin with. As for the issue of fresh and salt water, well, when you get flooding in the Amazon, for example, today, you get fresh water sitting on top of salt water out in the Atlantic Ocean. The two don't always mix. And so you will get pockets of fresh and salt water staying separately. Um, furthermore, you get salmon, as an example, that go from salt water and they spawn up in freshwater streams. In mm. every kind of fish, you can fish kind, biblical kind, you can find today salt and freshwater um, representatives. In other words, there have been genetic switches that made them now specialise more in salt water or fresh water, but it may have been that they initially had the ability to be in both. Furthermore, furthermore, how salty were the pre-flood waters? I mean, most of the salt we get in the ocean, most of the salt, the salt today comes from erosion, washing rivers washing salt down into the ocean, hmm. okay? So during the flood, you had all that erosion. Most of the salt in today's oceans would have got there as a result of the flood. So the pre-flood waters may not have been that, that salty at all. And they've only become salty as a consequence of the flood. So there's a number of issues there that we can easily uh, speak of to, to respond to those issues. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Dr. Snelling, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. You uh, you took the questions like a champ. You had amazing answers. Um, oh, Ryan, I, you know, we could spend several hours, by the way, um, and I get excited about this and enthusiastic, but, you know, there is information available, um, you know, Answers in Genesis website. People can go there to get answers to questions. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're all about giving people reason, reasoned answers so that they can defend their faith in God's word. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that was going to be my next question. Uh, do, you, do you have out any publications or anything like that that people could read as well? Well, yes, there's a number of publications. I have a more technical book called Earth's Catastrophic Past, Geology, Creation and the Flood. It's a two-volume, 1,100-page work. Um, but, I mean, it goes into all the technical details, but a, a level that I try to get help people, inform people, understand. But we have a number of publications and articles that are freely available on our website. A lot of material on the Answers in Genesis, AnswersInGenesis.org. And, uh, for example, I've written articles on the flood for our magazine, which is a layman's magazine called Answers. And those articles are freely available on our website six months after publication. So people only have to type in a question to the website and usually they'll find articles that will answer it free, free of charge. I also edit a technical uh, publication, which is open access with PDF files that people can freely do download. That's the Answers Research Journal. And so we have a wealth of material. We don't, you know, there's books and DVDs that people can purchase but there's also a wealth of material that's freely available for downloading anywhere, anytime. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show with me, Dr. Snelling. It's a pleasure, Ryan. Anytime. Glad to talk to you anytime. And I trust that was helpful to your, your listeners. It was. I'm sure it was. Thank you so much. Bye for now.